ahead. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Dee Dee Kramer, and I am a librarian here at San Francisco Public Library. Here to uh, say I'm excited to host Margot Note today to discuss creating family archives. Um, before introducing Margot, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to offer a land acknowledgement and then share um, an upcoming program announcement. So for the land acknowledgement, okay. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitish Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Ramitish Ohlone understand the interconnectedness of all things and have maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor the Ramitish Ohlone peoples for their enduring commitment to our rep, Mother Earth. As the indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramitish Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitish community. We recognize to respectfully honor Ramitish peoples who must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge and in how we care for San Francisco and its inhabitants. Um, so for an upcoming program on October 23rd at 1 p.m., we will be hosting a dialogue revealing an imperial war in San Francisco. And that will be um, a dialogue between Abe Ignacio, um, our Filipino American um, Center librarian, and um, MC Carlos. And now to introduce Margo Note. Um, Margo is a um, is um, a consultant and archivist and um, has, is the author of over seven books, including the one we're featuring today, Creating Family Archives. We're really excited to have her here. And I have to say, um, as a working archivist and librarian who has only recently begun to gather my own family archives, I found this book to be extremely useful and user-friendly. So thank you, Marta, so much for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, everyone can see a Creating Family Archives. I'm really um, happy to be here this morning to talk about something that's super passionate for me, um, family archives. Um, so let me just attempt to move my screen. Here we go. So our, our, our focus this morning is thinking about how we preserve memories and experiences. And the question that we ask is, what can you do that fills you up and fits your life? A lot of times when I'm talking with people about their personal archives or family archives, they feel overwhelmed. So some of this process that we'll talk about uh, today, as well as in my book, really strives to describe how to do archives in a way, kind of step by step, piece by piece, chunk by chunk to organize it in a way that is accessible and not overwhelming. And the question is, if we don't save it, who will? So taking this power, being in, empowered to organize our materials is both a gift to ourselves, but also a gift to other family members that are interested in our history. So everyone has stuff. And it's the stuff that we've created. So if you're a creative person, you've written letters, you've collected things over the years, um, those are part of your uh, family or personal archives. In addition, there's stuff that you've inherited. What I've seen a lot is with kind of the changing generations. If you're a 
grandparents pass away, your parents pass away, um, your siblings, you then inherit these materials. And then they might be totally organized or they might be kind of totally chaotic. So there's a, a ton of materials that you might inherit as well that relates to your family history. If you're a genealogist, you might have gathered materials over the years. So you've gone to um, historical societies, archives, uh, local libraries to gather pieces of your family history um, that are part of your research file. So again, this is part of family history that we want to organize. And before we continue, I want to define archives just so we're on the same page. So archival material is usually original, meaning it's one of a kind. It's um, love letters that your grandparents wrote to each other that if you were to lose them or they were damaged, there's no other way to replace them. They have what's called enduring value. So archivists talk about uh, records of enduring values. That means that when something was created, it had one purpose, but then it's being kept because that value is enduring. So for example, I have a, um, a ticket that me and my husband um, got when we went to City Hall to sign our marriage license. And it's like a deli ticket that you would get like at a bakery or a deli. Now that, that little ticket served one, one purpose just to make the, you know, like a bureaucratic, uh, bureaucracy and have the line move faster, but it has enduring value to me because it has romantic value. So it, 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 its original purpose was a transaction, but I'm keeping it in a locket that I have because it has enduring value, in this case, romantic value. Archival material are not necessarily old. There's a whole cliche about dusty, dirty archives and, you know, 100 year old documents, which is simply not true. You could be creating something today that would be considered archival because it has that enduring value. So let's say you open a, you open up Word, you start writing your life history. That could be that could be archival as well. Archival materials also rely on context for meeting. So a lot of times these items themselves don't necessarily, you can like uh, look at a photograph, for example, but it's usually a photograph in a group of photographs. Archivists always think in groups, not necessarily in items. So we're thinking about groups that have meanings and archival materials can be in any format. Throughout this presentation, I'll, I'm most likely going to be talking about documents like physical documents or photographs physical photographs, but I could be talking about um, maps, data sets, um, journals, scrapbooks, 3D objects that you have, um, any type of photograph, a digital photograph, a daguerreotype, the whole range of materials. So even though I'm using shorthand talking about documents and photographs, archives can be in all different types of formats. So family collections are really interesting. So in a formal archives, like an archival repository, there's lots of policies and like collection, uh, collection policies. And there's all these, um, this workflow that happens when things enter the archives. But what's unique about your own archives is that you are the curator, the archivist of your collection. So these um, materials might be only valuable to you. Um, and they're a mix gathered over time and kind of an eclectic mix. In my book, I talk about in my personal archives, I have kind of a strange range of things that are very meaningful to me. I have a letter from Iggy Pop that, uh, that he wrote to me when I wrote a fan mail le letter to him when I was 16. And this is really important to me. It has a little drawing of him with little um, antenna, like uh, alien antennas. I have a dime that my uncle swallowed when he was a baby that my grandmother found. She has it taped, you know, went through a system. She has it taped on a little kind of chipped piece of cardboard that talks about kind of its journey and that that's meaningful to, for me, even though it's kind of bizarre. And then I have my great uh, grandmother's braids. So she had two long braids when she was elderly. She had to get them cut off for uh, throat surgery. So I have them and they look alive. They look like they could be my hair. So it was a very interesting and weird mix. And I'm using that as an example, just to talk about, you know, 
everything that you have in your archives is important to you. It doesn't have to be meaningful to anyone else. So why organize? There's a ton of different reasons why. I think right now it's so important that we're talking about family archives because this is when we think about family, we reminisce, um, there's kind of family um, gatherings that are happening, the holidays, Thanksgiving, um, and we're starting to be more home, to be more centered. So you might want to organize things to distribute to family members. So if you have a ton of materials and you want to pass on your legacy, you might decide that you want to organize them so that when other relatives receive them, they know what they have. What I found is when people pass away and they have family archives that are kind of all over the place, it just looks like a big mess. Where if you organize the materials, you have them in archival safe boxes, which we'll talk about later in this presentation, and they're nicely organized, it tells everyone, oh, this is, you know, this is important. And it's really a gift to um, your legacy. You might decide that pieces or all of what you have, you might be able to sell it if it has historical value. Sometimes if it's, it does have historical value, you can donate it to a repository that would make sense. Again, this would be a conversation with the repository, see where it makes sense. But then again, you'd wanna have a little bit of organization to see what you have before you donate. You might decide that you want to organize things because you want to use it for a project. For example, if you're writing your memoirs or your family history, it makes sense to organize those materials first because then you can easily find them as you're writing or organizing. You could also use the materials for an event. So I found that things that are milestones like um, birthdays, anniversaries, um, the holidays, anything that that gives you a, a deadline, which is actually very good um, for, getting, for getting you uh, on top of your game to really organize things. So you can organize things for a birthday, for example. And also just because um, the reason that I wrote uh, Creating Family Archives and I wanted to make it in a publication that you could find on Amazon or your local public library is that I really wanted to give people the tools that, they, that archivists use to work with their own materials. So first things first. So if you get nothing out of this um, presentation, I really want, it, want you to take this, um, this next slide to heart. So you want to get materials out of harm's way. So that means you're not storing materials and things like sheds, garages, attics, um, any type of tran transitional place in your home or your apartment, um, because that can uh, damage it. So you want to get it away from the fluctuations of temperature and humidity, away from bugs, away from any place that could have, for example, flooding, or any type of damage. So you want to remove it from your uh, basement or attic or wherever you have it. And I always advise to store it in an interior closet, like a bedroom closet. This is a perfect area because it's away from windows. It's not necessarily near pipes or any heating or like a washing or a drying machine. And so it's kind of safely kept in your home or apartment. I should say when you organize the materials and you and you put them in archival safe boxes and enclosures, that footprint of the materials condenses considerably. So for example, when I work with private clients, sometimes I go into a living room and there's just like a pile of material. It looks humongous and people are thinking, you know, get this out of my house. I need to have this organized. But once things are organized that are in, let's say, um, three records boxes, that footprint is a lot smaller. So again, you can easily store it in a place like a um, closet. Oh, I see there's a question and the answer. I just want to see. Um, okay. Um, so what can we preserve? So <laughs> there's some things that we cannot change the chemical and physical composition. So all things turn, turn to dust and ash, including ourselves. So we, we you know, we can't um, fight against chemistry or physics, right? But we can change the way we store and handle them. So a piece of paper, for example, especially let's say a newsprint, is going to be really fragile. Over time, it's going to get brittle. It's going to change colors. Um, but it, if we preserve it in a nice folder, in a nice box, then we can extend the life of, of that material. 
So again, we can't really change the, the physical aspect of things, but we can change how we store and handle them. And that prolongs the life of these materials. Um, so handling. So I think, you know, in whatever, you know, 18 months, two years of this pandemic, we've all had a crash course in how to wash our hands and the importance of having clean hands. There is this cliche of archivists wearing white cotton gloves, and it looks really interesting, it looks really cute, but it's really not necessary for, for what we're working with. So as long as you have clean hands without any lotion or oils, you can handle these materials if you're careful. Um, you, you can have nimble and careful hands. The reason that we, uh, that I advise not using those white cotton gloves is because it makes you kind of more clumsy. It's, and sometimes that clumsiness can cause more damage. Um, as, when you're working with photographs, for example, you want to hold them by their sides rather than put your whole hands on them. I remember in a past job I had, um, before I was a consultant, I, I remember looking at this wonderful photograph, this archival photograph, and I saw that someone had put their thumb right in, uh, on the face of someone in that photograph. And that oil, that, you know, that one little thumbprint was very hard to remove and it stays there. So we have to be um, mindful of that. So if we're working with fragile materials, we want to make sure that we're supporting it if, if we're moving them around. So let's say we have a very um, fragile piece of paper. You can use a piece of cardboard and you hold the cardboard by its edges and then you can move it around easily rather than holding that thing itself. And of course, if you have anything that's oversized or heavy, you would want to have help with moving it um, so you don't damage it and you don't damage yourself. So you want to take stock, you want to take inventory of what you have. So I advise uh, when you're starting a project like this to gather everything together. This is also what, if you're familiar with Marie Kondo's work about decluttering and finding the joy and the, the spark of everything, she advises this way too. So gather everything together. I suggest putting it on a dining room table if you have one or a card table and a pinch when I've been working um, on site with clients, sometimes all I have is the floor. So as long as I put a, like a blanket on the floor, at least I have some surface to work on that's clean. So you wanna see what do you have? You know, is it mostly documents? Is it photographs? Uh, what are their conditions? Do you see anything that looks um, in bad shape? You're really kind of getting a sense of of everything that you have, but you're looking for some kind of red flags. So if you see anything that looks like there's been a pest, so um, you know dead insects, if you see droppings or nibblings of things, or anything that looks kind of gross and yucky, it looks like you know there's been mice or rodents or moths or whatever you what have you, you want to really take those aside and, and isolate them. The same thing with mold, and mold can can have all different formats. It can be uh, black, it can be white, it can be all different colors, it can be powdery. Um, mold is something that you should not mess with. It's terrible for your respiratory system. So when you see things like pests and mold, you wanna put them aside and get experts to work with it. Um, a lot of times you wanna isolate those bad materials so then you can work um, in a healthy manner with what you have. And you want to leave repairs to the experts. Now, I know this almost seems counterintuitive because if you see something damaged, if you, you see a photograph that's damaged, you want to repair it with tape. But the problem is, is that amateur repair causes more harm. I have seen so many beautiful documents that have been marred by um, tape and like discolored tape, tape that damages it even further. It looks ugly. It's much better just to have something like a tear already there. The best course of action is to do nothing. And then if you do need a conservator, there I have a website here, culturalheritage.org, that has listings of conservators and the different types of materials they work with. So textile, photographs, paintings, what, what have you. You really want to um, have things 
um, have experts take care of these things rather than try to do these repairs yourself. Whenever I see uh, tape uh, or glue on archival materials, it like, you know, it's a stake through my heart when I see it. So what to keep? So this is what in the archives world we call appraisal. Um, so we're looking at what we want to keep, especially if you're working with a ton of um, a large volume of materials that seem completely overwhelming. You're looking for things that are in, have importance, things that matter to you, things that matter to your family. Those things I think will be, I think, pretty obvious. You're looking for uniqueness of objects. So what is something that cannot be replaced again? Keep in mind, previous slides, we talked about archival value, having that archive, archival value is enduring value. So there's a uniqueness to it. It's, it's uh, one of a kind, it cannot be replaced. The postcards that you wrote when you were traveling Europe as a teenager, they cannot be replaced. That you know, middle school journal that you had cannot be replaced if they're informational. So sometimes um, materials can, the, the thing itself might not be important, but the information it contains. So for example, um, newspaper articles, that article itself, if you have that newspaper clipping, might be in terrible, you know, bad shape. And you can maybe find the scanned version online that, that has that information. You're not really concerned so much with that clipping itself, but the information it contains, it says something like a, an obituary of a great grandparent, for example. Things that are sentimental, things that give you kind of the warm, fuzzy feeling um, that remind you of relatives that have passed or experiences, memories, that's what you want to keep. I would also suggest keeping things that are interesting, things that are really weird that you don't know, you know what to do with. So for example, my father served in the Vietnam War and the Navy and he was a very taciturn man and not mu that much fun at all. But for whatever reason, he was the entertainment director on this, at the USS Jamestown. And so when they would pull into port, um, little boats would come and like throw out booklets of drink tickets because I knew that there were sailors on leave that had some money and wanted to go drinking. So there's these really weird like drink ticket books um, that are colorful and really strange that are part of his collection um, that I kept just because I find them like completely fascinating. And I would say if you're unsure, put it aside and revisit it later. Sometimes with archival materials, they bring up weird feelings. I know for me, I love looking through childhood photos until I do not. And I've like had my limit and I'm, I'm in my feelings. So if you have those materials that you've gotten from relatives or part of your past that are in some ways um, emotional and you wanna get rid of them. I mean, it's funny, I'm an archivist, but I love getting rid of things too. It's, it's kind of strange. I would say just wait and put it aside. You never have to rush to get rid of things or, um, or make these big decisions. Just leave it aside and then you can always come back to it. But I think when you're looking at what to keep, the things that to keep are gonna come straight at you, it's gonna be very obvious. And those things that you're kind of neutral on, you can spend some time in deciding. So you wanna concentrate on groups. So what I said previously is that archivists think about materials as a group. So if you have correspondence from a particular period of time, that is one group. You don't have to think of things as an item. I think sometimes people get um, overwhelmed when they think of these things as they think of them all individually rather than thinking them of them as groups and chunks. And you get to decide on the category. So you might have correspondence, um, journals that you have, scrapbooks, um, your mother's scrapbooks, your father's scrapbooks, you know, these kind of big groupings of materials. And that way, you know, when you've kind of taken inventory of what you have, you can go through these groups and then choose to concentrate on organizing that group. You should also ignore duplicates. So I see this happen a lot with photographs. Back in the day when you'd go to the photo mat and they'd have those, you know, discounts of, you know, you can get three copies of this photograph. I, I find that when people are going through their personal archives, they get caught up in getting rid of all the duplicates or organizing the duplicates. 
And you could do that. You could spend your time if you're, if you want to, but the time that's spent removing those duplicates doesn't really save you much space. And it could be more wisely spent on organizing some of these groups better. So, and I will explain this in a passage from Creating Family Archives, but I do wanna talk about two archival concepts. One is the idea, idea of provenance. So that's a history of ownership. It includes the origin, the creation date, the description of the materials, and the rule is all records and a group connect to the creator. So for example, if you have things that you've inherited from your father and things that you've inherited from your mother, you want to keep them, your father's stuff and your mother's stuff. You don't want to intermingle them because we get a sense with provenance of, of what those materials are. And again, I will explain this in a passage shortly. The other archival concept is original order. So keeping records in the same order as when they were created. So that could be chronological, alphabetical, geographical, numerical, or topical, or however you do so. So for example, if you have, let's say, business records of an uncle, um, and he organized things chronologically, or somewhat chronologically, you wouldn't take those files and then rearrange them alphabetically. Not only would that be a waste of your time, but it takes away from that idea of the original order. So your uncle was thinking about things chronologically. So there is some information that that's kept as part of that original order. So I will go and I will um, explain what I mean. So I want you to meet Grace and Maria. And this is an example of these two archival principles I just talked about. So imagine that you have two collections of recipes, one from your maternal grandmother, Grace Chen, who is Chinese American, and one from your paternal grandmother, uh, Maria Mercado, who's Puerto Rican. Grace's recipes are written neatly on index cards and organized alphabetically by food groups in, in a plastic recipe box. Maria's are written in English and Spanish on scraps of paper, stuffed in envelopes and organized by the type of dish and by the event. Archivists wouldn't intermingle Grace's and Maria's collections in one group called recipes because the collections should be separated by the creators. Examining how each grandmother organizes her group provides knowledge about them, so you want to maintain their order. For instance, Grace has multiple recipes for noodles, noting which one is her husband's favorite. She has recipes to create meals for many people, which came from growing up in a large family. You can tell that she loves to bake based on the number of her recipes for cookies, pastries, and tarts. Maria's recipes tell a different story. She's more interested in organizing her recipes by dish. Her focus on events is a valuable insight too. Birthdays call for a special flan and traditional Puerto Rican dishes are reserved for the holidays. Her bilingualism reflects the legacy of the recipes that were passed down to her and her use of paper scraps show shows how frugal she was having grown up poor. Her recipes don't need many ingredients and use inexpensive products. Her cooking technique is showcased in her recipes with many details. If you combined both collections or decided to organize the collections the same way, you would lose revealing information about your grandmothers. So again, talking about Grace and Maria, they have two different approaches to how they have recipes. And if we were gonna just put together a collection of, you know, grandma's recipes with both of them, you would lose some of that provenance and original order that really helps us um, give us some information about how they organize and use these recipes. So collections always reflect their creators and we want to preserve that organization um, when possible. So thinking about the order of how to do things, we want to first organize the physical before we digitize. I know, and I totally get it, people rush to digitize things because having things digitized um, gives kind of better access and you can show, you know, share things with people. But what I found is that if you don't organize the physical first and you start digitizing, you have a physical mess and a digital mess. It's much better to organize all your physical assets first, Th then you'll get a sense of what you have and what really should be digitized. And then as you digitize, it's, you're creating a, uh, a mirrored structure based on that, the physical arrangement. So you have a nightly, nicely organized physical collection and then a nicely organized digital collection. I also suggest if you have a ton of materials that you're trying to organize, 
to start with paper documents first, because with any type of documents, even if you don't know what they are, you can look at them and read them and figure out what they are. So if you're given a piece of paper, you look at it, you can tell it's a letter, you can see who was writing to who, the date, the events, the tone of the letter, what's being talked about. So it gives you a lot of information. Whereas most, most images, especially images in personal and family collections, they might not have that information. At least, you know, it's not unless it's written in, in a caption on the back, for example. So if you've organized the paper stuff first, sometimes you could get a sense of the major players, what's been going on. So let's say when you look at things like photographs, you have some of that knowledge to help you do the detective work around those photographs. Um, you want to arrange the materials. So you're skimming the content. Uh, content. So you're, of course, maintaining that provenance and original order that we talked about and thinking about are there labels of the materials? Are they accurate? You want to note the formats, the date ranges, the conditions of what you have and seeing if there's gaps or if there's fine. So sometimes if there's gaps in the documents, maybe another family member has it or maybe it was lost or maybe it's somewhere else. A great example is my poor brother, who's younger than me, thought that there was no there wasn't a lot of baby pictures of him when I never really realized this until recently because he was looking, we were looking at the print photographs. Well, for whatever reason, when my brother was born, my father was like obsessed with slides. So there's a huge uh, slide, you know, so we saw the gaps with the print photographs, but then he saw, you know, there are baby pictures of him. They're just in slides that we, you know, were stored away elsewhere. So again, you have to find those, those gaps and those jewels, those finds that you'll, you might know about that you found or um, that are like the jewels of your collection. You wanna remove the bad stuff. So things like rubber bands, ribbons, um, they discolor things, they um, ruin the integrity of the object. Staples and paper clips can rust over time, which is also damaging. The same thing with glue and tape. Try to remove these items if you can, if it causes, uh, if you can remove it safely and don't laminate. I think this is more of a trend in the past, but lamination basically makes a chemical sandwich where your precious item is in this chemical sandwich and it, it can't go anywhere. And that's the, the problem too, is that lamination is um, not reversible, um, which is problematic. So get to good enough. So again, so you're not overwhelmed, organize good enough. So resist the temptation to savor as you're organizing. You can always look back. You really wanna prioritize. So I say, you know, get a baseline of organization and then you'll see parts of the collection that you'd like to organize a little further. And be realistic, just, you know, not everyone has all the time in the world to archive their, their family archives. And it is, uh, it can be a little emotional, um, draining at times to organize these materials. So, so be realistic and be, um, be soft on yourself in trying to uh, organize your family archives. You wanna manage your time. So you write down the action steps that you wanna do. Um, see how long it takes you to work on a piece of your collection and then course correct. So if you know you're spending too much time, pull back a little bit and use a, a time management system. I'm a big proponent of what's called the uh, Pomodoro technique or the Pomodoro method, which just means you set a timer for 25 minutes, you work uninterrupted, totally con concentrating on what you're doing, and then you take a five minute break. And that alone, even if you do, you know, a 25 minute bit of organization, maybe every day or a couple times a week, you'll see a lot of uh, progress in what you're doing without getting that overwhelmed or exhausted feeling. So create an inventory. Archivists call this a finding, which, which is a very, very robust inventory of what's there. So it helps with locating items and information. So if, if I have an inventory of, I know that, you know, X, you know, this material is in box A, that material is in box B, that material is in box C. I don't have to dig around the boxes, especially if I have a large collection. I know by looking at this, 
um, this inventory where everything's at. So it helps reduce handling and it gives you what archivists call physical and intellectual control, which just sounds so awesome. So basically what that means is you know what you have and you know where it is. And it's a lifesaver, um, especially if you're working with a lot of materials, you know that, you know, I want to look at the pho photographs from the 70s. I know it's in box two for example, it saves a lot of heartbreak and it really gives you an overview of everything that you have. So what's missing? So if there's parts of your history or your family history that's missing, that's not documented in what you have, talk to family members. This is a time to really reach out to people and document those stories. I know that when I was a teenager, for example, my grandmother is Lithuanian and I at least I'm so thankful I had the mindset to let me write down phonetically these funny Lithuanian sayings that she would say. And I'm so thankful that I did that because she's no longer here and I can't ask her. And that was a lovely kind of legacy that I had. So especially if you have um, older relatives, you want to get their stories. So you can talk to them, you can interview relatives formally or informally, and you can also create your own records. So you can document your own, own life. If you're missing a piece of that archives in the, in the documents or the, the stuff that you have, you can tell your story and create archival documents as well. So as you're organizing, you're looking at supplies. Um, we're looking at boxes, folders, envelopes, and sleeves that can really help us organize and protect what we have. There's vagueness in some of the description of these materials, like when something's called archival quality or photo safe. I see this a lot, let's say on Amazon. Those, the, that terminology is kind of meaningless. Instead, we're looking for these phrases, acid-free, which means part of the, um, creation process to take out the acid out of any paper-based products. Linden-free, meaning that it, it that part of the um, paper, that, that wood pulp, the lignin can be um, really damaging. So newspapers have a lot of lignin in it. So that's why they get uh, brittle and um, fragile over time. And anything that's gonna be around photographs, we're looking for this phrase, photograph activity tests, the PAT or PAT. And that basically means um, there's a um, organization that does stress testing of these materials to make sure that they don't damage photographs over the long term. And they, they pass this test and therefore they're safe to have around photographs. Storage can be things like vertical for standard size papers, like what, what we have here. This is actually part of my personal archives. If you have things that are oversized or fra fragile, you could have a horizontal box. And I suggest two um, places. So if you have a container store that's local, they have a part of their store. And this is the only store like a, a, a national chain that I know of that, that has this available. They have a whole section that has some archival material, like things for photographs and um, photo albums. It tends to be a little bit more on the pricey side, but if you want to see what these materials look like, that's a place to go. I also suggest shopping at Gaylord Archival, which is gaylord.com. They were one of the sponsors of my book. I have an article there about how to get started on, on your archives. And what I like about them is their customer service is excellent. Um, they've called me when I've kind of screwed up orders and said, you know, did you really mean this size and not that size, which is a lifesaver. But they also have a lot of educational materials available, available on their website, which is very helpful. So digital collections. I've talked mostly about physical artifacts, but we do want to think about digital collections. So if you're digitizing materials, either you're doing it yourself or you're hiring a vendor to do it, we want to keep the originals. A lot of times people digitize stuff and they throw out the originals, which is horrible. You want to keep that original, that original stuff because if anything happens to those digital files, um, your history is gone. You want to back up what you've digitized in three places. So in the cloud, in your computer, and a hard drive. And again, if something should happen, let's say your computer conks out, you still have things in the cloud and a hard drive that you can back up these materials. Digital collections require proactive maintenance. And this is a whole other um, 
graduate course to talk about digital preservation. But there is some upkeeping with digital files just to make sure they don't get corrupted, that their files don't get old. And then when in doubt, print it out. So for example, I mean, this is not, this is obviously something I don't advise organizations with huge archival collections to do, but for the home archivists, I suggest printing things out. So for example, on my phone, you know, I take a ton of photographs. I have it, the digital files backed up, but I also, you know, use an app to my local drugstore and I print out those photographs just so I have a physical copy as well. So then I know I have multiple copies everywhere. I have physical copies of these digital photographs and I'm good in case anything happens to those digital files. So all of this, I've kind of had a whirlwind of where we've talked about a lot of, of things. My book, Creating Family Archives, which I believe is available at the San Francisco Public Library, um, and it's available in all different types of libraries, is a great resource. And I really created it because I wanted to give people the tools that archivists use in their own home. But I wanted to make it that it was manageable, that was it was relatable. Um, so. I suggest you can get it at Amazon. And then I also have um, a part of my website, margonote.com um, slash creating family archives, where I have other um, resources to talk about creating family archives. I really wanted to give an aff affordable or free resources to make sure that people are saving their legacy. And that leaves us time for some questions. And I did see some questions as they came up. Um, so I see um, someone asks, uh, could you please discuss strategies for dealing with slides? Like your brother, much of our childhood is in that format. Exactly. I love slides for a variety of reasons. One is that of all the photographic formats that I've seen, people are more likely to write captions on those slides. You know, people aren't necessarily writing captions on print photographs or any type of like older um, documents. Um, but slides are great because it sometimes captures that information in captions and sometimes has dates very obvious. Um, for slides, they're also, uh, what's great about them as well, is that they're very affordable to get digitized because they're the same format and you can either do it yourself with a kind of um, a slide uh, with your scanner. If you have a home scanner, there's a way to put the slides and it can easily um, digitize it. Or if you're going out to and hiring, let's say a local digitization vendor, the price per slide is very affordable. Um, so that's what I would suggest for that. And I can also look, um, okay, see some more. So what should donors consider before approaching institutions that might receive collections? Great question. So donors should think about, and I, I've, I've actually helped with my, um, with some of my private clients where I've, working, I've worked through materials and I'm like, oh, this stuff needs to be in, a, in an archives. So it's a matchmaking process. It's seeing what the collection strengths of the archives. Now, the thing about archives is to maintain archives is ex extremely expensive. Um, and we want to make sure that the repository has um, an obligation to protect what's, what's most historically important. So one way to be to get a sense of see what you have. And then if you and do some research, if you think a repository would make sense. So if if you have something that's related to a specific aspect of World War II and you find a repository, for example, that that does that, you would see what their collection policy is. Does it does it go under the umbrella of what they're looking for? And then you can start a conversation and they might want to take a look at it. You might have to have, if it's valuable, some type of personal property appraisal as part of that process. So you can write off um, that as a donation. And you'd most likely, I, I would hope that you would sign something called a deed of gift, which says, you know, these are my materials, I'm giving it to you for safekeeping. These are the legalities of it. This is the copyright, you know, all of that, all of that information that's on a page that everyone is on the same page about that donation. So, you know, 
ask around, but be mindful that, you know, archivists can only take on so many things and it has to be within that collection uh, umbrella that they have. Um, so uh, thank you for this informative presentation. My family has boxes and boxes of our father's documents. He was a professor in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. After we digitize each document and keep them on a computer or hard drive in the cloud, what should be done with the paper copies? I guess for not to find an archive that wants the print copies. The college he taught at does not have an archive. Do archives accept electronic copies? Not sure they would want or have space for a lot of boxes. Um, they could take on those. Um, digital aspects, I would think that they would want the physical. Um, so when I was talking about digitizing, you always want to keep the physical because if something should happen, God forbid of those digital copies, you have those physical copies. Um, I don't know what else to, to add. Um, someone else asks, are there resources preserving very old photo formats like daguerreotypes, et cetera? So I love daguerreotypes. Um, which are beautiful, at, you know, the first photo format, I, I should say, I love amber types, that, that's, but that's like the redheaded stepchild of early photo history, in my opinion. But daguerreotypes are beautiful, but they're extremely fragile due to their nature. Not only are they old, but the materials that they have. So I would look at places like Gaylord Archival or other types of photographic um, preservation um, options online to see how you could preserve them. A lot of times you would have them in something that would be like a clamshell box that would be protective of the, the thing itself. So it doesn't, it doesn't break apart. There's some padding and there's some, um, you know, nothing is touching um, the surface because that can be damaging as well. So uh, what are your favorite national companies for digitizing slides and videos, printing negatives, et cetera? You know, it's funny, I really don't have favorite national companies. There, I, I know that there's, the, the big one is Legacy Box. Uh, I think that works in a pinch. So personally, when I work with private clients, I always um, handle their things, or if we get a digitization vendor, they do a courier, uh, courier service to pick it up and drop it off. The thing about these national companies is that you have to send the materials through the mail. And for the most part, you know, if you're using something like FedEx, I think you're gonna be okay, but that's still something that makes me a little bit nervous. And I know because they're doing such a high volume, the, um, the quality of the digitization, like on VH, like the HS tapes are not the best, but I think it's workable. So that's one aspect. What I would also consider is looking locally in your community to see if you have a local vendor. So sometimes there's mom and pop shops like a framing shop or a, a camera shop that does this on the side where you can drop off the materials and then pick them up. That to me, I think is, I mean, I always like to support local businesses. I think that makes me more comfortable that you know things aren't getting lost in the mail. But again, you know, you can take the risk with things like Legacy Box. I know that uh, a friend of the family digitized all his old tapes from when he was younger, and it was awesome to see my my father at this dinner party where he, you know, he's not alive anymore. He said something really funny, and like that memory was totally recaptured. And the the quality of the tape, I think, was fine. Um, so that that was really cool. Um, so do you recommend particular materials for adding captions to photographs, like a specific type of pen that won't cause additional damage, organizing photos? My parents have boxes and duffel bags with photos and Ziplocs and otherwise organized only roughly chronologically. So for the captions, I suggest um, on the back using pencil on the edge with a very light hand. There are some kind of archival inks that you could use. I'm not a particular fan because I think sometimes they can get smudgy. Um, so yeah, pencil on the on the very edge. I also suggest um, maybe this won't make sense for this question because it sounds like there's a large volume of materials. If you have a certain set of photographs, for example, if you number them, and then on a Word document, for example, you know you have these longer captions. That's nice 
that's nice too, especially if those captions you're finding more information in time. So that original caption might be, you know, family barbecue 1976, where you don't know who's in that barbecue. But as you're working, you recognize, okay, that's, you know, Aunt Stella, that's cousin Maggie, you know, you can start adding information. Oh, okay, great question. Okay, I have a photo album from the late 60s with relatives of my deceased grandmother, unnamed and untitled. The photos are in someone's idea, idea of order, but the album is one of those self-stick with clear page covers. This is probably bad for photos, but I'm hesitant to take apart the whole album. Any suggestions? Great, great question. So that's um, what's called a magnetic self-adhesive album. And they're terrible. They're absolutely terrible because they're not magnetic, but they have adhesive. So keep in mind, adhesive is terrible. So I had something similar. Um, my baby book when I was born was in this magnetic album and it was arranged. So what's awesome about albums or scrapbooks is that someone, if they've done it right, they've organized it in a particular manner that we want to keep that order. We want to keep that original order. So what I did with my album and what I suggest you might do is you can buy a archival album and it has little photo corners and it can also go in a, a like a dust jacket. So it has all these layer of layers of protection. And what I did is I spent a couple hours in an afternoon and I recreated that album. So I saw that, okay, this one page has four pictures of me as a baby in this order. I recreated it in that safe album. And that way I kept that, that album organized. It, it gave information, but the photographs are not now safe. Okay, so I have 10 boxes of family photos going back to the 70s. How best to organize these? Some are stuck to sticky photo album pages that were popular years ago. Is it safe to remove them and put them in a new photo album? Can I note the date and people and pen on the back of the photo? I hardly know where to start. Thank you for your great presentation, very helpful. Thank you. Um, so again, you wanna take them off those sticky photo album pages. If sometimes that adhesive is so old that you can easily just um, take it off that page without damaging it. If there's a stickiness to it, sometimes what, hel what helps is having, um, you can warm up the photograph with a hair dryer so that adhesive gets a little warm. Then you take um, some um, like floss, like uh, wax floss, and you can put it behind the photograph and kind of gently wiggle it off the page and that removes it. Um, I wouldn't suggest putting captions in pen, but in pencil, that way you can always erase them. And that's a way that you can, you know, preserve those photographs, but get them out of that damaging environment. And it's funny, th those types of albums are still being sold and it, I, I go ballistic when I see them in stores. Um, so if you need help interviewing the older generation, how do you instruct your helper how to get the best results? Are there guidelines anywhere on how to conduct a family interview? So in um, on that page, the Margo notes slash creating family archives, I believe I do have some blog posts listed there that have questions to ask your mother, your father, um, general, like I think there's 300, um, 400 questions or I, these are older posts, but they do have a list of questions to ask people. If you look online, you can find a ton of genealogy and oral history sites that give you some conversation starters. There's also, um, if people don't want to talk and would rather write, there are some kind of cute gift books that you can get, um, like on Amazon that are kind of, you know, that your relative could fill in, you know, what was it like to grow up at this time? Or, um, you know, what was your first job? What was a funny story from your childhood? I would suggest a simple, this is the most, the simplest way is that when you're seeing them next, if you, if you're physically seeing them, let's say at a family event, take your phone and just do, a, and just have them be recorded. And at least that's something, you know, or um, put them on YouTube, like a private YouTube video, or, you know, capture that moment. It's more about um, capturing the moment than being um, being perfect. There's a ton of resources online about conducting oral histories. The Oral History Association has a ton of different resources to take a look at. 
that can give you some hints about how to do it very professionally. But but for me, it's more about capturing those stories, even if it's on the back of a napkin. Like when I, uh, when I was talking about getting those kind of funny phrases in Lithuanian from my grandmother, I mean, she's such the type that she kept every piece of paper to use. So the back of the envelope, I just wrote it down phonetically. And so that, that's valuable. It's at least capturing it. Do you recommend a photo scanner or what to look for in a scanner with a feeder? I'm trying one that has an automatic feed for speed. So for scanning, I don't have any recommendations for scanners. I think what's available for the home market, they're all, in my opinion, they're all basically the same. Once you start, um, once you start getting more into commercial scanners or more expensive scanners, then, then they get fancier. Um, for the automatic feed, I would only suggest that for materials that can take that beating. So if you have contemporary letters that are um, organized well, that aren't crumpled, that don't have staples or anything, you can put it through the feeder for speed. But for anything that's somewhat precious or fragile, you would want the type of scanner that, you know, the flatbed scanner. Another way that you can approach it um, depending on what you have is also to use a camera setup. So I have um, a camera and like a, uh, this light box that can fold up that looks like a big artist portfolio, like a heavy artist portfolio. And so sometimes I've used that for my own stuff or for client stuff to photograph. And it, it does make it a really nice photograph of what you have. Sometimes the materials that you have can are either weirdly sized for um, a scanner or are odd to scan. So that's, um, so I think I'm checking more questions to see if any more are coming in. And I see some questions in the sh um, chat. So what to look for for a photo scanner? Um, I would say something that's, you'd want to have at least something that's a letter size or larger. And it really depends on what your price point is. Um, if I'm, you know, I'm talking a lot about scanning and photographing, photographing things. Again, if technology is not your strong suit, I would always suggest contacting a local vendor to see if they can do, do this for you. They can do really high quality, um, scans and they can advise you about what formats you should use. How do you label digitized photos if you can find them easily? That's a great question. So you're thinking, um, you're talking about kind of file naming conventions. So for me, it really depends on what I'm looking at. So um, with the, the file names, I like to think, especially if it's being organized, sometimes I suggest putting that date first. So, and it's the four digit date. So, you know, 1955 um, underscore, you know, the full name. And I would suggest, and I, I do go into details about file formats and how to label things. I would suggest instead of like, you know, Mima and Pipa, you use their real names in, in the photographs and then um, if you have a location. So try to think about ways of organizing things so you're getting information in that title, but also when you're looking through the files, they are nicely organized. So you're not like digging through. So I, with some projects, I've put the year first and that's helpful. Could you talk more about the light box you mentioned? Yeah, I actually have it. Well, if I, I have it over there. So basically I looked online, um, it's through Amazon and it looks like um, when you fold it up, it looks like an artist portfolio. So it has a handle and it's like a cube and then you put it out and it's about, I know this is not helpful. You know, it's a good amount, you know, like a big black cube with a white interior. And then you can plug it in so it has lights and it and it has a white background, like a seamless background. So you can set things up and then 
either from the side, if you wanted to, to photograph things from the side, or from the top, you're looking down through a hole and then you're photographing the thing itself. And it gives a beautiful image. And I only knew this because I hired someone to do um, photograph some uh, private collection for me. And she came with it and it was amazing because um, a lot of what I do with my private clients, I mean, I have organizational clients as well, but with my private clients, sometimes I'm working in people's homes. So it's not like I can really set up a bunch of equipment. Um, so it is really nice and it, and it folds up nicely. So it, it, I mean, it is heavy, but you can travel with it. Um, and it's really quite amazing um, for a product. A lot of people use it for if they're like selling things on Etsy or eBay, it's a good way to have, um, it's a good white cube to photograph things in because you don't get a, you don't see like the seams of the side. Uh, 13, 11, we have one more question, a couple more questions. Marta, I want to thank you for an incredible, oh wait, I see one more, one more, so something like this, but then I don't see anything else. <laughs> and if you, I should say, you know, my emails here, if you want to email me, um, well, I'm not going to open up that link because I don't know if it's going to show, but if you want to email me, I can show you what I got, but it's, it looks like exactly looking at that link, the Amazon Basics Portable Foldable Photo Studio. That's basically what I had or what I use and it's very helpful. So thank you so much, Margo. This was incredibly informative and thank you all for coming. Um, you'll be able to watch the recording over and over again on YouTube. Thank you so much. And the book is available at the, at the San Francisco Public Library. It is still in order, I'm okay. embarrassed to say. We've been having some supply issues like many people, but yes, we are struggling and will receive it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think it's only, um, you know, it's available on Amazon, right. Day Word Archival as well. There's different places to get it. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you like this talk and found it informative, there's tons more of information within that book. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Pause the recording. Nick, will you just hit end? I will hand, hit end the record. Perfect. Bye-bye. Thank you, Margo. That was awesome. Take care. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Celeste Hike was, Hike was here. Um, she says hello. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, the last I saw her was in Prague a bazillion years ago at this great library trip that we went on. Yeah, she, I was texting with her. She mentioned that that you guys went to Kutnohora, um, the ossuary. Yes. And she's yeah. a great person to go with because she's kind of like a little witchy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wonderful. That was the best trip. It was so much fun. Yeah. Um, thanks again for, for coming. Really, really appreciated your presentation. Take care. Bye-bye.